Let's do everybody's favorite thing, rankings, or rather in this case, talking about rankings. The Athletic did two projects this summer, ranking the off-seasons of every team and putting every player in a tier based on how much they impact winning basketball and championship basketball. We'll discuss those from a Pacers perspective today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers, as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the Westside Community News. And today, we are talking about a Indy Pro Sports team that did not play a preseason football game this weekend. Locked On Colts is the place to go for that. But instead, the Indiana Pacers, and specifically two projects in the athletic this summer that I absolutely loved and can finally talk about the Pacers inclusion in these projects. One from David Aldridge who did an off season rankings for all 30 teams under the guise of who got the most better. I should have phrased that better and who didn't improve at all or got worse. And that is an interesting way to rank the off season. And we'll talk about where the Pacers stood in that project. And then Seth part now, uh, formerly in the bucks front office did a tier ranking for every player in the league of, most value added to a team on a championship quest down to least, or in his least in this case, is the 125th most value added in the NBA. Where some Pacers landed on that list, I think is a very interesting topic as well. Joining me to talk about these very interesting things, Jay Rigdon from Awful Announcing and Golf Journal. Jay, returning for the second time now. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. How are you doing, Tony? Excellent. I am excellent. It's a beautiful Sunday. The Fever play today, which I'm excited about. Uh, it's their last game of the season, which sucks, but is, uh, they play today, yep. which I'm looking forward to. Uh, let's start with David Aldridge's project, which I uh, he does this every offseason, I believe, uh, or at least a couple now in a row. And what he does is he ranks the NBA team's offseasons on how much each team got better. So I believe the Timberwolves were, for example, near the top, even though the trade they made for Rudy Gobert was considered you know, very poor value by a lot of people, they got better way better, right? They got Rudy Gobert onto their team and they did not have him before. They finished fifth, for example, even though, you know, if you look at the assets they gave up, you might not rank them that high. And so the goal of his projections is who got, who improved the most and who didn't improve the most. And I thought when I read the headline, the Pacers were going to be last. And Jay, they weren't last. The Pacers avoided last in this project, but not by much. They were 29th. I think he listed it out pretty well. Brogdon left. T- or was traded away, T.J. Warren left, Ricky Rubio left, Lane Stevenson is still out there, Dwayne Washington changed teams, and they added Daniel Tice and then an unproven lottery pick, a couple rookies. Where did you think on the list when you read that it was about how much the team improved or, in the Pacers' case, didn't improve? Where did you think they were going to be when you dove into this project? Yeah, I think given the, the sort of really zoomed-in approach he was taking um, on that and his methodology, like there was no way they weren't going to be near the bottom. Like It's hard to tell. They're... I knew they'd be probably bottom five, um, I, and that's where they were. So kind of right in that range. 29th is really low, but I totally understand, based on what he was going for, why he put them there, for sure. So I thought they would be ahead of Utah. <laughs> right. <laughs> was, was the inverse team of the uh, Gobert thing with Minnesota. Utah was 27th. I thought they might be ahead of the Lakers, who added some bit players. I definitely thought they'd be ahead of San Antonio, who they are ahead of. San Antonio was last. And then, like, Dallas lost Jalen Brunson. I wasn't sure how much... You know, getting Christian Wood would would keep them up, but it seems like they got worse. So I I I think this is an interesting discussion because you know the Pacers off season was not about getting better. Like if you just ranked the off seasons on best to worst, not about getting better this year, but like the long term outlook of the team, which DA does a very good job of saying that is not what this is. You know, they'd be much higher. But I do think it's interesting to think like, did they get 29th? you know, worse. Do you, like, I don't think they took that much of a step back. They only won 25 games last year. Like, I don't think they're going to be significantly worse than last year. I thought they'd be ahead of some of those teams that I just said, for example, I thought they would settle in about like 24th or 25th. Yeah. And they took it. It's just kind of all comes down to what other teams are doing. I guess feel like they're not in a vacuum. So that's always kind of hard to say. And I think there's a reasonable case to be made that they could be a little higher there. Um, like even adding like, 
I mean, there's a chance that Brogdon leaving and for even bringing in someone like Aaron Naismith who can play games, that could be a net positive. I mean, Brogdon was so unhealthy and so rarely healthy the last few years. Like, that might be a short-term victory. Like, it's hard to say. But, yeah, I think generally it's hard to complain too much. If they'd been 25th, I would have been okay with that based on the methodology. But, I don't know, it's, it's all so close at that level. It's hard to tell. It's fascinating because I've been workshopping this as a full podcast topic before. I don't think I will do it. But, you know, Brogdon was hurt a lot all the years he was here. TJ Warren didn't play at all last year. Rubio didn't play for the Pacers at all last year. So yes, their new additions are younger players or they're Daniel Tice, who's, you know, a a rotation level vet, but they play. So like, it's not crazy to me that one, them just playing makes the Pacers buoy or stay about the same. And two, look, I know that they had an all-star level player in Sabonis last year. Brogdon was on the team for the first three months playing at a high level. They lost so many close games, like a historic number of close games. Like if their luck flips a little bit this coming season, though, the idea I was workshopping was like they could win more games just by like existing, <laughs> just because yes. they'll be healthier. And and even if luck doesn't swing all the way back in close games, but just a little closer, like two Chris Duarte foul calls at the end of the Lakers and Hawks games, for example, you know, that's two more wins like. Those sort of things, like it's not insane to me to imagine that they are win the same number of games, at least this coming season. And so because of that, because of the context of their injury situation, their luck last year, you know, they have the same coach in the offseason for the first time since 2019, which is crazy to think about. They actually have a direction picked. Like, I don't think they'll be drastically changing their roster midseason this year. Like, I don't think it's crazy to say that they didn't get worse, which it seems like you know, I guess the Lakers, you could say, got a little better and they were 26th in this. But like, it seems like most of the teams in the bottom 10 got worse in this exercise. And that's why I thought they might be a little bit higher because I think they probably will be about the same level of team they were last year. But maybe that's a little too Pacers colored glasses way of looking at it. Yeah, I think the way they so they sort of did a half tank i guess i don't know how to really describe it at the end of the season you know like turner turner could have played uh, probably right. they, they kind of like they they made choices like that um and but a lot of those games like I, we <laughs> they've they were really competitive into the fourth quarter in so many games they ended up losing it was really like the ideal way to watch a tanking team they weren't going out there getting killed from the first quarter on every night like we could watch fun basketball quite often throughout the year and then they lose the game anyway it was really the best of all worlds um for the long term <laughs> direction so yeah i think that's a, there's some definite regression chance there. Um, and then there's also potential progress for guys like Halliburton, um, the full year with the team, full year in the system, another year of growth as a player. And it's, I think they could definitely get better. Uh, you know, Mathurin coming in, like they're Matherin. Sorry. <laughs> I hadn't actually said his name out loud on a uh, recording before. So Matherin is what I was going for. Um, yeah. So I think there's, he's looks like at least a rotation level player. He's fun to watch. It'd be interesting to see him grow. I mean, it's so, yeah, I think it's, you could definitely see them taking steps forward. I think the Pacers suffer a little bit in national pieces like this, just from being the Pacers. Um, they're just kind of, it's, it's easy for them to get knocked down a few steps because it's just, you know, they're, it's a more, they're kind of bland occasionally. This is actually the most interesting they've been because they're taking this actual directional step um, and trying to make more progress long-term. Um, and for a ranking like this though, that prioritizes strictly just trying to compete this year, like they clearly did, very little to do that. Um, so I think it's easy to sort of say that, yeah, if we're, if we're here, we're here, but they could definitely overachieve this. It's, this could look wrong at the end of next season, I think for sure. But, DA is awesome and, and does a good job on these projects. Like it's really hard to do this for all 30 teams. But I, I also think, you know, if you are from the national level and you're just like 5,000 foot view of the Pacers, right? Their additions outside of Tice are all young players. Like even Jalen Smith, who was good for the Pacers last year, is an unproven young player, like nationally viewed. And then Matherin's a rookie, and Nembard's a rookie, right? Kendall Brown's a rookie. Outside of Neesmith, who is also unproven, like all of their additions are are young players, and all of their losses are like, oh my God, the last time we saw TJ Warren play, he was one of the best 15 players in the NBA. Or like, oh, Malcolm Brogdon's really good, and he's actually on the court. So like, I understand from that like way up view of what their offseason looks like. It's like, oh wow, they got way worse. But in the context of what happened to the Pacers last year when they win 25 games with those dudes playing, you know, Rubio, Warren, and Brogdon play combined like 41 games for three players. Like, even Levert, who they traded in February, it's like they, they finally have the direction and health and, and really zoomed in. I don't think they'll be that much worse this coming season, but we'll have to see, and I understand where he's coming from. Yep. Yeah, no, I agree completely.
Hey guys, let's take one short little break so I can talk to you about Built Bar who are making the best tasting protein bars ever. They're basically healthy candy bars. They're protein bars that are 100% covered in chocolate. They're delicious, soft, easy to chew, and they're healthy, which makes them awesome. The, the chocolatey goodness is good in all of them, but they have a new great flavor, cookie dough puff chunk. They have chunks of cookie dough in it, and marshmallow puffs are right in it, 100% covered in real chocolate. Absolutely delicious, and that flavor, only 160 calories and 15 grams of protein in just one bar. You got to snag a box for yourself. They have a mixed pack you can get on their website, which is two of a lot of their most popular flavors. You can get it all at Built.com. They have so many good flavors, and it's collagen protein that your body absorbs faster. You can try it yourself. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCK15. When you check out, you'll get 15% off your order. That promo code, again, is LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. The big question with an exercise like this is, you know, let's, is this the right way to rank off seasons? I'm not saying it's wrong, actually. Like, he, he this project is very helpful because, uh, you know, you look at it like he is Philly number one, and Philly got better, and they were really good last year, and they were very close to a conference finalist team, and, you know, the team's near the top. Like, are they now good enough to catch Golden State, to catch Boston, to catch whoever? Like, Milwaukee's in his bottom 10. They're a team trying to make the conference finals. Like, in the view of the 2022-23 NBA season, very useful exercise. In the view of where are these teams headed, what is the path they are headed down, where where will this offseason look 10 years from now? Because let's go back in time a little bit. You know what the Pacers got really good marks for? You remember what offseason they did really well in, according to a lot of people? 2018, when they got Tyreek Evans and Doug McDermott and Kyle O'Quinn, and they filled the holes they needed in the Cavs series, and they finally got a shooter, and they got that depth big they needed, and they're going to start Sabonis now. And, oh, my God, they have not won a playoff game <laughs> since that offseason. And I thought that they did a good job filling holes, but had some long-term criticality for that offseason. Either way, you look back, and that offseason was a mess. Like, sometimes it's hard to, to get the big picture on this stuff. And so what I would like to propose is, we do right now, <laughs> where would you rank the Pacers offseason in the project of the direction of every team? Because this, this was actually a little hard for me, because their biggest thing they tried to do they did not do, but the the opportunity cost of them doing it is very small, right? They lost, Dwayne Washington gets a two-way with Phoenix. Okay, they lose him to go after Aiden, and yes, that deserves to to ding their offseason. He was a quality young player for them last year, but I'm not sure it makes me ding them a lot. So there are a lot. The, the, the interesting thing about this is, you know, if you if you zoom out and say they lost Brogdon and Warren and Rubio and Lance and Washington for Neesmith, Tice, Brown, uh, Nembard, and Matherin. You go, okay, that is a good offseason for a rebuilding team, but not like a knock it out of the park. They only had to re-sign Jalen Smith of their own free agents. You know, that's like a C-plus offseason. So if you ranked it in the context of all the teams, they'd probably be like 16th or 17th. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Absolutely. Where would you would you have any quibbles with that? Do you think there's any way it could go higher? Like, to me, the way it goes up is either Matherin is an amazing pick or Neesmith Smith like really pops in this trade they made with Boston. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I think if you wanted to dive really into it, you could you could say that from a Pacers level perspective, the fact that they were even willing to throw that max offer sheet at Aiden, like that is a huge step forward for me as a fan. Like I, I feel much better about the fact that they were willing to take swings like that. Um, that's a big positive sign. And I know it may be grasping at straws a little bit there to like read into something that didn't actually happen and probably never had a chance of happening at all. Um, but it was still a really, a really big win for me there. But yeah, I think if I think the Matherin pick is the one that's going to be that's I think if if they could get like a star level player there in a few years, we look back and, you know, you know in two years when we're doing the redrafting the draft post that everyone does um, after the fact. Like, if we're, yeah, they're those. really they're awful. But in this case, uh, if, if Matherin ends up looking like, oh, he should have been the second or third overall pick, like that is a huge, huge right. win in offseason. Right. Um, that's a great, that's a great level. I think that's really the, that's probably the most upside there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably the way to look at it. Yeah, it's weird with the, like, a draft pick being the swing thing for your offseason. That's, like, never the case for the Pacers, really. I mean, I guess last year it kind of was with Duarte, but last year the thing was, is Carlisle the right coach, right? Is health going to be enough for this team? And the answer was, uh, maybe and no. <laughs> and so last last summer looks kind of rough, right? And so the the kind of big zoom out questions are are a little tougher, which will be interesting. I think two things get in the way of me perfectly ranking this Pacers offseason in the context of every team in the league. And I would say you could probably rank 22 teams, 23 teams perfectly now. They're done. 
Would the Nets still, whatever the heck they're going to do, if they do anything, the Jazz, who the heck knows what's going on there, maybe the Knicks too, the Lakers, you know, all these incomplete teams. The Pacers are well below the salary floor. So they might not even be done. One, that makes it hard for me to rank. And two, now that they didn't get Aiton and they have kajillion dollars of cap space that will they then have next year, you know, if them rolling it over means they get someone great in their ecosystem next year with Halliburton, with whatever Matherin is, with whatever Duarte is at the time, you know, oh, wow, this offseason looks really good. They did a good job keeping their powder dry to get a good player. But if they don't get a great player or they can't really piece themselves into getting involved in these bigger trades that may or may not happen, who knows? They have to get to the salary floor somehow. You know, that would change the grade a little bit. They would have lost some opportunity. They would have sat on their hands a little too much because next summer is their last chance before Halberton becomes expensive to really pounce on stuff. So it's hard to grade their offseason now, and it will still be hard until next year. But that's the sort of thing that makes it hard for me to perfectly rank. Like if they get great assets in a Westbrook salary dump, oh, wow. Now all of a sudden it's like a top 10 offseason. They use their caps brilliantly. Or if they can poach some young player from the Knicks or the Nets in a big trade, like – that's great. That would be really helpful in the way that the Cavs did in the James Harden trade. They got Jared Allen for like nothing in that trade. You know, those sort of things can swing this and have not happened yet. And I will be curious if those sort of things happen and change where we look back on this offseason. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely a lot of variables still in play. And the other thing to think about it, uh, and it doesn't really align with what this athletic piece was going for, is I feel like from a Pacers perspective with what they're trying to do, I feel like they hit a lot of those goals. And so if we're just judging it based on like from an internal perspective and the direction they're going, then it's hard to really say they did a bad job when they did what they wanted to do. Like that's, you know, that's other than eight and not joining, but still like they they didn't have really full control over that. And so I think like just because those goals don't line up with, you know, trying to contend and compete this year, like that's they're never going to show up in a piece like this. And it's fair to also quibble with, you know, the overall direction and the goals they have, whether it's the right choice, whether they're approaching it barely on their end. But I think for what they're trying to do, like, I think they've really taken a lot of steps in that way. And it's hard to really knock them for that. So that's a good point is the goals have to be considered in doing these exercises where you rank them all. Like, I guess Golden State's tough because their tax bill is like the most insane thing ever. So, like, I get them in theory wanting to cut spending or lose like a bit player. But like they lost Otto Porter and they lost a couple other key guys like this offseason right after winning a title. And like you get the honeymoon, your fans are like kind of going to shrug at the stage. But, you know, getting DiVincenzo and Jermichael Green, but losing Gary Payton and Bialica and Otto Porter and Toscano Anderson, like that's bad at offseason. Like you should be trying to stay as good as you were. You know, they would get dinged in an exercise like the one you just said, where goals are considered. The Suns, same kind of deal unless they get KD. I guess they're still kind of incomplete in that exercise. Miami, you know, they lose P.J. Tucker. You know, the, when they were trying to get better, they didn't get anyone particularly fantastic this summer. You know, they, the Bucks, like I said earlier, like they sort of fit the, the thing of like, oh, wow, they were trying to get better and they failed. Losing Jalen Brunson for Dallas. The Pacers don't have any of those things. I guess you could count on count missing Aiton, but that's sort of a, an institutional control of restricted free agency beyond their control, unless they totally blew the bluff of a sign and trade. But I think you'd say that of the goals they wanted of get younger, like they only have three players over 26 now, get more assets. They got an extra first round pick. They got another ex lottery pick in Neesmith. Yes, they accomplished those goals. They are now younger. They are now more asset driven. They have space. They can be a team that is flexible and has a lot of options. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's for where they're at right now with the talent they have and what they're looking to do. That feels like pretty much exactly what they should be doing. Um, You can argue with maybe, the talent they brought back or the quibbled the exact moves themselves, but it's hard to really say that they didn't do what they wanted to do. So there's a reason they were patient, right? Because mm-hmm. that's what flexibility allows you to do. Survey the options that if none of them are good, you don't, you I mean you had to hit the floor, I guess, but you don't have to do anything. You know, it's not like a yeah. requirement by the league. You have yeah. a team, you have your young guys that you like. And this is the first time I, I suppose last year you could say a little bit, but this is the first time in a while that, the draft picks will be the story of the Pacers season, and that sort of signals the direction that they're headed. You know, Duarte being good made him a story last year, but last year was about will the healthy pieces connect. Basically, since Turner are coming off of the PG injury, they haven't. The, the the draft has not been the story of the season in a way that it will be this year, and I think that's very interesting from a perspective of a franchise that doesn't normally lean that way. All right, let's pivot to Seth Part now who is, first of all, a genius, <laughs> a very smart person. And I think the way he did this exercise 
is a very interesting way to tear off players. I don't think that I don't think anyone else who does player rankings like ESPN will do their top 100 later this month, and I will not do a podcast episode on that because usually I always go, huh? Uh, but this way, I think, is a good way of doing it where he tears it to where, okay, the top tier is like this can be the best player on a championship team has done. And he even said that he thought there were too many players in the tier. He has 10 guys there. And there's like a second tier of like, okay, these guys are, are a really good team, probably good enough to make that happen. And then you know, he says there's like 125 guys who give you championship equity every year. And I thought that was an interesting way of doing it. And the Pacers' best players are in Tier 4. And I cannot find, for some reason, the Tier 4 explanation article. Even though I have six athletic tabs up on the top of my screen, I somehow cannot figure it up. There it is. Uh, so he says, Partner says, I consider anyone who makes it into one of these tiers a player who could provide positive minutes for a contention-level team. Tier 4 is where we start to see real needle movers. There is even a smattering of recent all-stars in the mix in Tier 4. And that is where the only Pacers who make his tier list are, and that is Tier 4B. Tyrese Halberton is in this tier, and Miles Turner is in this Tier 1. Do you think any other Pacers should have made it here? And 2, do you feel like those players are properly placed in their tiers? I think it's a hard sell to say any other Pacers should have made the list at this point. Okay. Um, I think... <laughs> I think there's a case made that some could make a leap this year to that list. Um, but yeah, I mean, just based on the talent they have and and what they've shown so far, no, I don't think there's a, there's a, the only thing I could maybe have seen is moving Halliburton up a little higher. Um, I think that would have been maybe a reasonable, a reasonable case to make there. Uh, but as young as he is and he hasn't really, you know, he's in a new setting. Like I could see waiting the year to make him to, to see him show that growth and make that a case. But I think he has um, the most upside there for sure of anyone on the roster. Yeah, so this tier as a numeric ranking is his biggest tier. Forty Players 41 through 84 are in this spot. And Halburn's interesting because two years ago, obviously he was a rookie, not ranked. Last year, he was in tier 5, and now this year in 4B for part now. 4A, for example, the tier a little bit above, I suppose, where Seth has these players. Has guys like Fred Van Vliet and Jalen Brunson and Jared Allen and Tyrese Maxey and OG and Anobi and Sabonis is in 4A, for example. Like, this is how he is viewing... Tyrese Halbert in this exercises can be a very good and useful player on a title team. I am also that high on Tyrese Halbert. So thank you, Seth Partner, for having a rubric that agrees with me. Um, but anywho, yeah, I thought that that was interesting to, to – I thought it was interesting to see him that high because I, I, I'm i high on him as futures for sure, but I was surprised to see him in that sort of spot where it's like, oh, wow, like you view Malcolm Brogdon and Tyrese Halbert right now as guys who in theory contribute equally to championship equity. Oh, wow, you view – you know, uh, Seth Curry, Tobias Harris, guys who are, you know, valued in big time trades right now as veterans is in the same tier kind of there. I thought that was very fascinating. And I thought he was the most interesting place pacer because I think we all know what what Turner's role can be on a good team. And he's been kind of, you know, overcast in the two playoffs, the two most recent playoff series Turner has played. They were playing the Celtics without Oladipo and they had no creator. And then they were playing the Heat without Sabonis and they had limited creators. You know, he's had to do a lot more in his role. But I think on a team where he has the right creators next to him, and he's just being a defensive guy, he'd still be better in a playoff setting. He's been in 4B or Tier 4 for three straight years for part now, but I thought Halberton's inclusion and and ranking in this list was the most interesting thing to me because that's a really high ranking for a 21-year-old. 22? 21? I can't remember. 22 now, I think. So 21, 22 last season. But yeah, like it's... It is. I think for me, I just love his game so much and I love how he fits with where the NBA is going and is at this point. Like, I think that's why I see it as like, this feels like the right spot for him. Um, yeah. But he's also played on very bad Kings teams and a very bad Pacers team <laughs> so far. So it's hard to really say, oh, he should be much higher at this point. But he does. Yeah, I think part now in his explanation did note that of the people in that tier, he has the star level upside more than anybody does, which I thought was a nice little uh, boost there as well. And it's hard to really put him in the same category. Like, you know, as you mentioned, guys like Jalen Brunson, like who just, you know, balled out in the playoffs. Like it's it's hard to really say, yeah, he should definitely be up at that level or higher at this point based on what he's accomplished so far. I, I, I thought it was interesting, like, to look and see if any other pages would be there because at first I was like, oh, wow, I can't believe there's not another one. And then I was like, wait, <laughs> I mean, if you get going on their salary alone, like, okay, Buddy Heald makes 20 something million. So maybe he'd be there. Nah, he prob- probably shouldn't be <laughs> uh, when yeah. you think about it. And uh, you know, Daniel Tice is like an okay role player. He did not uh, make the list at all either. You know, Tier 5, for example, is like Joe Harris is in this. Carousel Vert, former Pacer for 
is a tier five guy. Like your bench scores that you need in a playoff setting, Spencer Dinwiddie, Bojan, another former Pacer is here. You know, I wouldn't have you buddy healed on, on that kind of level or role. And then Tice is solid, but like the centers in this tier, uh, the, first of all, there's not very many because Seth is not arguing that, that centers have the same level of championship equity. But like Maxi Kleba is here. He was just very valuable for the Mavs in the postseason. Kevon Looney's in here. You know, I would not put Tice in that level. And everyone else on the Pacers outside of McConnell is like a young, unproven player. So I didn't think anyone else should make it. Um, but I thought that that maybe those two guys, I at least thought like, okay, maybe let's see who's in tier five to see if they have a shot. But I don't think they should be there. Yeah, I think I think Duarte would maybe have a case for tier five. Because I think if he'd been on, if like, if the Warriors had drafted, had drafted Duarte, like I think there's a reasonable case <laughs> that he might have played some playoff minutes. And I think maybe he gets viewed a little differently at that point if he's in their rotation and, oh, that's a know, good as point. a shooter. Um, again, but I don't think based, and he's also a little older, so it's a little easier to say, like, you know, we're seeing what he is and can be for the going forward. But I think it's still, based on what he did with the Pacers, a very bad team. Um, it's still hard to really say that he should have been on there. But I think of all the Pacers on the roster right now, I think he has the best case if with another good season to jump into this list next year. You uh, stole my next question. Oh. <laughs> you, gotta let me, you gotta let me get them out first. My bad, dude. That's all. That's on me. <laughs> <laughs> You're totally fine. Uh, yeah, like in that tier now, I'm not comparing Duarte to these guys, but the skills it looks like he'll be good at. Like Marcus Morris is here, for example. Like he can, he can easily reach that level just with his shooting and defense. Robert Covington is here. He can reach that level with his shooting and defense. Bojan is here. I don't think he'll reach the full offensive Bogdanovich package at least in the next two seasons or so, but he might be better defender like today. So I think he could reach that level of impact, for example. Not – like, he could get there this year with his improvement, but the Pacers, like we talked about at the top, will win 25 games this season, 27 games this season. So it might not go noticed right away, but I think he could reach that tier. Uh, other guys, you know, Matherin will get there eventually, presumably at least. I mean, we're only going off of summer leagues. I don't want to yep. launch him into that expectation now, but he's got a chance. Now, Isaiah Jackson's one that I thought would be interesting to consider, like the, the rim-running, high-flying floor spacing big in the playoffs. Like, can't. I guess Robert Williams, uh, not floor spacing, um, vertical spacing big in the playoffs. Like, can Isaiah Jackson be Robert Williams ever? Robert Williams made this list. Uh, I don't know if he'll have that level of offensive impact or that sort of defensive range and bulk to get there uh, at least soon. But I think he's a guy who could eventually reach this list and have some championship equity, which is important because you know right now the Pacers only have one guy. Like, if you want to be a title team, you have to have, like, five guys <laughs> on this list, maybe even six. Yeah. Exactly. I think, and Jackson's, he's playing with the right point guard here in the right setting to yes. maybe reach that potential. And so, yeah, if, if he's, if he's going to get there, if he doesn't get there with Halliburton and can't play in this and with this team at this minutes now, he's not going to get there. So like, we'll see for sure. Um, yeah. I think that's, that about sums it up. I mean, the Pacers talent right now is either young and unproven. And there's, like you said, there's what three players over 26 on the roster, like Buddy Heald at this point isn't, he actually, I thought he looked better in Indiana than he did in Sacramento at all. Yes. Um, but so I think with another season this year, if he keeps playing that well and his shooting holds up, it's there's a chance he can maybe jump onto the list. But if he's playing that well and his shooting holds up for Indiana, he might not be playing on the Pacers anymore <laughs> by the end of the yeah, season. If he's even so, on the Pacers on opening night, right? Yeah, exactly. It's hard to really tell. Um, but yeah, so I think that's kind of where they're at right now with the list for sure. The last guy I would I would give a sentence to here is Jalen Smith. Uh, with the Pacers, Jalen Smith is not at this level, but could get there because he could defend and shoot and dribble a little bit. Not a lot of dribbling going on. But you know, even if he's just like a, a mobile-ish big who can shoot it, like that's a good player. Uh, but Maxi Kleba, for, like I'm saying with the bigs, like you got to be either a really good defender with mobility or a really good shooter. And the inconsistency makes me not know if Smith will ever make it. He's totally a guy we're taking a flyer on at the price the Pacers did, home run signing to be able to keep him given the restrictions. Like Nikola Vucevic is in Tier 5. Like that is what big – that is how hard it is for bigs to have high-level championship equity at this stage of the NBA. It's like you got to be really skilled or really mobile, I think at least. Like Sabonis is mega skilled. That's why he's able to rank pretty high on this in the top 50 players. Turner's an elite defender. Like can Smith get to any of those things? I don't know. Is the shot real? It looked really good at first, then sort of tapered off, but he started so hot that he still finished at 37% with the Pacers. Can that hold? I don't know, but I think he has a shot to get to this, but it, the shot has to hold or else I don't think there's any way he could do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. He has to be able to space the floor. Um, otherwise, it's not going to work. I, I Can I ask you a question based on yes, this? Yes, I like, love that. Uh, yeah, uh, Turner's still in Tier 4 here. Um, 
is that hard to square with how it's seemingly been hard for them to actually find trade value for as often as he's been on the market here? Like you would think for a player who can give you that much based on based on partner's rankings here, like it seems considering how available he's been, how much they've considered moving him, they haven't yet. Like, is like do, do you think teams around the league view him at that level uh, still, or is it good question? Uh, I don't know because uh, so a lot of the teams that would be like, we need, I, I like no team's going to talk like this, but for the sake of this podcast, for the teams that would say we need a tier four center to right. you know, round out our lineup. Usually they're already good or have a serviceable guy at that spot. Like Kevon Looney, like Brooke Lopez, like Robert Williams, who like they're good and they're obviously belonging in a playoff rotation, but you don't need to give up like a ton of stuff for them. Whereas the teams that would want that, like, Charlotte, like New Orleans a year ago, like New York a year ago, like Toronto forever uh, until last year. And they finally got the five seed. Their asset, their pick assets are too strong and they're really attached to their young players because they're ascending. So like there's never been like the perfect timing fit and his injuries have come up at terrible times for the Pacers Yeah, to think about moving him. So I, st- I, I still think that he has value and the Pacers have dug their feet in the sand on what they think that value is and they want to get it. For a million reasons, they've never gotten that offer, and they might never get it. And that might look bad for them for holding him for a long time if that happens. But, you know, I think he does have that value when he plays. It's just hard for teams that need that sort of value to give up it, if that makes sense, given the context of what his position is and where he's been in his career. Yeah, no, I think that does make total sense. It's kind of where I'm at, too. Like, it's, I think that's kind of the most interesting thing to watch with him on the expiring deal here to see which direction they go and when and like what that actual return is at some point. That'll be really fascinating. Um, so, yeah, I do kind of think that that tier four is kind of where I see his ceiling at at this point, though. I agree. Um, so, like, it's, I think. So do you want that on the Pacers team going forward? Do you want to like try to find value? It's I don't know. It's fascinating to watch. I just think it's interesting to see him actually rank that high still on this list um, based on his this season last year. I know the Hornets have had interest in Turner forever, and I don't know what any offers specifically have been. So I'm not going to kill either team for any part of this exercise. But part of the reason I feel like the Pacers value him really high is like in the past, like two years ago, especially when the Hornets were pretty good and made the play in in LaMelo's second season, like that seemed like a perfect trade fit. Like, 25-year-old big, solves your defensive issues. You guys have too many young players, quality young players that fit the Kevin Pritchard player MO and picks. Like how, you know, the fact that they never came to an agreement either means the Pacers value him really high or you'll, you'll never believe this, but the Hornets were stingy in trades, which maybe it's just the nature of the GMs of those teams. But I think that could be sort of revealing in Turner trade talks that the team that in theory would be like the perfect, perfect fit to do this. And they still could be this year if their young bigs like Mark Williams don't look good yet. If they still don't ever get something done and it could be a, another team, but you know that that's sort of revealing to me. Jay fever play in three minutes. So thank you yep. very much for the time. <laughs> Where can people follow you and all your work? As you yeah, can um, frequently now. Yeah, at jrigden5 on Twitter. And then um, pretty much all my writing is at Awful Announcing these days. So you can find me there pretty much every day of the week. And that's where I am. Awful Announcing cover stuff that no other sports site covers. And I appreciate sure. that. I need more <laughs> places that cover aspects of sports that are uncovered. We will be back this week with topics sort of TBD. I have a roughly planned list. But as we try to land player interviews this month, Uh, they will be a little bit on the fly in terms of when those players are available. But I believe tomorrow I will finally begrudgingly talk about Victor Oladipo's tweet about his Pacers exit and Paul George and DeMontis Bonus, plus some conversations I had with Pacers players at Victory Field earlier this month. And the Pacers' preseason schedule is out-ish. Maybe they have a fifth game we don't know about, but mostly there. We'll cover all that tomorrow on Lockdown Pacers. Hope everybody had a great weekend, and we will see you tomorrow.